At the 12 month outcome, uh, we pre-specified that it had to have an 80% likelihood of being superior to placebo by 25% or more. That was the 80%. The actual results were that it was 64% probability of being superior at the 12 month. So it was relatively close. So let me just give you an example of what that might mean. People are used to regular statistics. A, if um, a p-value, for example, of 0 .0001 is a very high hurdle to expect, this is what was said here. So when I show you data that shows you p-values less than 0.05, don't be surprised because the hurdle was much, much higher than P.05 at that point. So, are you ready to see these numbers? <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, in order to assess this, down at the bottom we have a scale. One asterisk is 0 0.05, two is 0.01, three is 0.001, and four is 0 0.0001, okay? So all doses using PET SUVR are, have four asterisks. If you look at the, um, and shows a nice dose response, uh, reduced uh, amyloid PET values across all the numbers. We also looked at the centiloid scale and is observed mean changes, baseline was 74.5, and it reduced this to 5.5. Uh, That's about a 93% reduction, 92.6 something. 70 units on this scale. Next slide. Now, we have some more information we're gonna show in the next uh, uh, presentation. Here for ADCOMS, there are four, we're only gonna show on the next several slides, the top two doses, placebo, and the 25% margin we were trying to overcome. So the bottom in black is placebo, the dotted red is the 25%, the blue is the second highest dose, and the green the highest dose. And you can see that at six months, the highest dose started to separate from placebo statistically at the 0.05 level, and it continued through the entire trial, reaching a 30% difference and a p-value of 0 0.034 at 18 months. Now for the traditional endpoints. ADOS COG. Here, as you see, we had a 47% reduction in decline at 18 months. We were above the 25% line throughout, starting at six months. And the second dose also showed a nearly 25%. So we have nice internal trial validation that it's not just a single dose that is doing that. That second dose is very important. Now CDR sum of boxes, again, 26% reduction versus placebo, and above the 25% line throughout the study. One thing is to understand, CDR sum of boxes is a cognitive and a functional endpoint. ADCOMS is a cognitive and functional endpoint, but with selected um, questions out of those that are responsive early, and ADOS COG is a cognitive endpoint. These patients don't have, in these earlier populations, don't have a lot of functional impairment. It's mostly cognitive. So these results make perfect sense, to me anyway. Um, we have some additional things uh, in terms of CSF biomarkers. I'll present this afternoon, but for the sake of time, I'm not showing that here and the adverse events. There's a few important things. Adverse events, 
serious adverse events and treatment emergent adverse events, including death, et cetera, are no different across the treatment groups, placebo, or any of the doses in this study. The most common reactions were infusion, react, uh, a infusion reaction and area E, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and there were no changes in labs, EC, in EKGs, and vital signs. Infusion reactions had a higher incidence at the higher doses. We had a pretreatment regimen so that the patients actually stayed in the study without significant difficulty and we present the small numbers that needed to drop out of the study because of those infusion reactions. They tended to occur once and then we started to pretreat them after that and that seemed to uh, solve the issue. Area E. As we reported in our press release, all treatment groups had less than 10 percent. The highest treatment, uh, the highest doses had the highest uh, amounts of area, all 9.9 percent in this case. And the APOE positive group had 14.6, higher, of course, than the APOE ne negative, as has been reported in, in other trials. Most of the area E occurred early, and area E is a very interesting problem. Most of them are totally asymptomatic. In other words, if you weren't doing an MRI, the patient would never know it, the doctor would never know it, and you would just keep dosing through it. So this trial started at a time before area E was well understood, and therefore health authorities were conservative in terms of what they would like to see. Now this might not be the case. In addition, only five cases out of those 48 were symptomatic, some of them very mild, probably wouldn't have been identified except they had an MRI at the same time. And there were a couple of cases out of the five that were rather significant and would have been identified easily uh, because of that finding. So, in summary, for, this is the first large trial to support the amyloid hypothesis. There's been smaller ones. We have a presentation on our Ellen Bessestat here at one o'clock that kind of did the same thing. Aducanumab has had data uh, provided that support this hypothesis. This uh, response adaptive design identified the top two doses as it was supposed to and the best dose at 10 milligram biweekly. There was a dose dependent statistically significant reduction in brain amyloid at the highest dose, 93%. And the majority of subjects, and this, I didn't show you this slide, but 81% went from amyloid positive to amyloid negative. In addition, dose response clinically meaningful and statistically significant uh, declines on clinical outcome measures of cognition and function at 18 months ADCOMS with 30% less decline and on cognition alone, ADOS-COG 47% less. CDR sum of boxes, 26% less at 18 months. I think uh, what we do see is that amyloid, uh, certainly the amyloid hypothesis remains uh, something that ha needs to be, continue to be tested. And this is the second trial that is demonstrating a clearance of amyloid in the brain through PET imaging and perhaps other biomarkers, which we hope to see at 3.30, uh, and also has hints of uh, some efficacy in cognitive tests. Uh, the first, as you will all recall, was uh, in the angicanumab trial that was reported uh, at CTAD. The solanezumab trial, just to remind you, did not report uh, clearance uh, of amyloid and was a very slight, I think, uh, I would say slight result in terms of the movement of the cognitive endpoint. The Alzheimer's Association is certainly uh, encouraged uh, by seeing things like this come to the fore and these discussions happen in scientific forum that are very important uh, for the scientific community to hear and learn about and ask questions. And we're pleased with a variety of different approaches that are being utilized now and being seen in phase two. Uh, trials, even though most of our phase three trials are still right now anti-amyloid uh, treatments. 
Uh, it's important, again, for this data to be presented here at a forum like this. We have more, almost 6,000 researchers gathered here. Uh, there will be an opportunity for the field to discuss these results today at 3.30 and ask questions uh, of, um, uh, of uh, Lynn Kramer. So we will have that opportunity later today. And additionally, that opportunity for discussion is critical not only for the field to learn about what these results are, but to then reflect on what that means uh, for other ongoing work that's happening in the field. This will be the first time when a trial that has utilizes a Bayesian design, um, an ADCOM outcome measure, uh, 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 which are two very different things that have traditionally not been used in a trial, but in trials in Alzheimer's dementia before, uh, are going to be discussed by the scientific community. And so, Though right now we're not quite sure what we might make of this data, we might want to continue to discuss that because we know that what we have been using for the past 15 years uh, has not generated positive results. So it's important for the Alzheimer's and related dementias field to be thinking more broadly about what we can do in order to get those more effic efficacious medications to our loved ones as soon as possible. And that really is the goal of what we're trying to do here at the Alzheimer's Association's International Conference, but also our goal at the Alzheimer's Association. So I look forward to discussing these results further, not only with uh, the leadership at ASI and Biogen, but also with the scientific community at large, uh, and look forward to hearing more of the results that we didn't hear right now at 3.30 uh, on the rest of the biomarkers. So thank you very much.